Bob Herbert's op-ed.tv is made possible in part by the CUNY TV Foundation with the support of Ann Ulnick. Hi, I'm Bob Herbert. Welcome to Op-Ed.TV. My guest is Dr. Maya Rockymore Cummings, a woman who has worn many hats, consultant, writer, politician, you name it. She was the wife of the extraordinary Congressman Elijah Cummings, who died in 2019. His death was a tremendous loss to a country mired in desperately difficult times. Maya and Elijah were also important figures in my PBS documentary, Against All Odds, The Fight for a Black Middle Class. So it's a great pleasure, Maya, to welcome you to our show and to see you again, even if it is virtually. It's great to be back with you. Always good to talk with you. <laughs> so um, <clears throat> for those who may be unfamiliar with Congressman Cummings, he was a prominent member of the Democratic leadership in the House. But he was much more than that. I mean, in my view, he was a, a, a great man. He was an inspiration to his colleagues, uh, to his constituents, and to the, to the country at large. Uh, you knew him best. What was it about Elijah Cummings um, that made so many people think that he was so special? I really do think that Elijah saw people for who they were, not through labels, not through filters, not through race, class, gender. Uh, but their essence, uh, their spirit. He had this tremendous uh, ability to what he called feel people's spirits. Uh, and it kept him grounded. As you well know, he was a son of two preachers raised in, uh, you know, kind of the Christian faith. Uh, but, you know, it kept him grounded. And whenever he was in a situation where everyone seemed to be, you know, uh, you know in disarray, uh, he just remained focused and steady uh, and kept people reminded of the bigger picture, the broader goal. He always said, it's not about you, it's bigger than you. And so, you know, I think that his colleagues and friends, and certainly I did, uh, always appreciated the fact uh, that, you know, he was so, uh, he was so committed to uh, social change, but also uh, he was just a steady hand on the ship. Uh, he was he was truly wonderful, and I know people just say that all the time. They they toss it around, but I mean, I really mean it. But I'm late to the game. I mean, there's just all kinds of people who who rec recognize what a, what a wonderful man he was. I I, I loved. Uh, we're going to talk about his book in a moment. I loved the introduction by Nancy Pelosi when she talked about his moral clarity, and at a time when. Um, uh, that seems to be in short supply. That was also extremely welcome. Um, the book, um, which was published posthumously and, and which you contributed to, is called We're Better Than This, My Fight for the Future of Our Democracy. There it is, right on. Yeah. And, there, and there he is. I get, I get emotional just seeing a, a photo um, of him. What was it that prompted him to write that book? What was it that he was trying to say? Well, first of all, I, I'd been on him for like eight years to write a book. Uh, I felt like he had so many great stories that I really wanted the world to hear his stories. But, uh, you know, everything fell into place literally within the about a year and a half, uh, within the last year and a half of his life. Uh, we found a, a, a collaborator for him uh, and he was able to tell his story. But the two primary reasons he wanted to tell his story was one, he wanted to inspire young people. Uh, Elijah had been through so many obstacles in his life, you know, born in the segregated South as an African American. Uh, you know, he knew what it was like to be excluded in this society. He also knew what it was like to be labeled special education at his, as a young kid. He had so many obstacles. He was from a poor family. They were from the South. They moved to Baltimore for better edu uh, opportunities. Uh, and so, you know, Elijah wanted young people to see that he had huge obstacles. And he was able to rise uh, and, you know, as long as he continued to pursue his dreams, he was able to rise and achieve them. He wanted to inspire young people. And the second was Donald Trump. 
uh, <laughs> wanted to <laughs> he wanted to warn the American people that Donald Trump was a dangerous man, right. uh, and and he, not just unfit for the position, as many people said during Donald Trump's term and even before it, uh, but also a, a threat to our humanity. Uh, he he saw you know what happened at the border because he was responsible for overseeing. Uh, as the chairman of the Oversight and Reform Committee, right. uh, he thought that the Trump administration and Trump in particular had a cruelty streak uh, that was, uh, you know, really illustrated in terms of how they ripped those families apart and yeah. took kids away from their parents. Uh, and he thought that a second term of Trump would bring that out full force. And then the, the last thing is he thought he would be a direct threat to our democracy, that he had no respect uh, for our form of government, uh, and that if he had a second term, he would tear apart our democracy brick by brick. So we've been talking about um, Elijah. Let's talk a little bit about you. Um, where did you grow up and, and how did you come to be so involved in, in pol national policies and politics? So I'm the fourth generation from slavery in this country. Uh, and my parents, uh, you know, their folks, folks, folks were from the Louisiana, <laughs> moving into Texas. Uh, and so, you know, uh, my folks are fourth generation Texans. Uh, they grew up picking cotton and living in the Jim Crow South and telling us their stories of what it was like uh, to grow up in separate, separate and unequal schools, uh, you know, to actually have to sit in the segregated part of the movie theater, uh, to have to drink out of the Negroes only water fountains. Uh, and so our lives were very different because my dad went into the Air Force uh, during the Vietnam War era. Uh, and so we moved literally around the world. We lived abroad, we lived all over the United States. Uh, by the time I graduated from high school, I'd been to nine different, uh, I lived in nine different places, all near or on military bases. Where, as you well know, respect for you know our democracy and the Constitution and the American flag uh, were driven into you, uh, you know, like the second nature. Right. But what was interesting about our family is we saw the juxtaposition, uh, you know, of what this country had done to uh, people that looked like us, our ancestors, uh, and then of course, uh, you know, the whole notion of the country not meeting its ideals was very real. And so it drove me on a quest to see how we could use the tools of politics and policy to drive social change. And so I became a political scientist, uh, earning my PhD at Purdue University, uh, and then coming to Washington uh, in 1997 <laughs> to collect data for my dissertation. And what do you know, one of the first members to actually give me an interview was Elijah Cummings. Is that right? Yeah. Oh my goodness, that's fantastic. Yeah. Um, you, you know, among the, I mean, you've worked on so many issues, so we have to uh, narrow it down in order to get a little bit of focus. Uh, but uh, among the important issues that you always were focused on uh, were diversity, uh, inclusion, and uh, equality. And um, we're not going to spend the whole show talking about Donald Trump, but I do want to ask you uh, from your perspective um, about um, how you see the, the damage that Trump has done to the progress that was so hard won over, over so, many, uh, so many decades. It was very difficult every step of the way. And, and yet he has just caused so much damage in, in those areas. So can you talk about that a little bit? Absolutely. So the first, I think, thing that he did was through his irreverent profanity I mean, his uh, absolute, uh, you know, <laughs> irreverence for, you know, certainly the civil rights movement, uh, the women's rights movement, all the, the uh, disability ability movement, uh, right. all of these things, he basically just tossed out the window, not when he took office, but in his campaign. He basically uh, lifted the lid off of the Pandora's box of hate uh, that had been managed, that we had as a society had managed to place uh, on, you know, the more egregious elements uh, of our um, country uh, through our struggle for civil rights, for human rights, for women's rights. Uh, and so he just, you know, he basically through his rhetoric uh, and his language, which I always argue was the language of the Third Reich, meaning that he was willing to use dehumanizing language uh, 
uh, to describe people, uh, you know, such as immigrants and people of yeah. color, African Americans, people living in urban cities like Baltimore, where I'm sitting right now. Uh, in order to entire African, sorry to interrupt you, but entire African nations, entire African nations, and and there is a consequence to that kind of language. It allows people to not see pe other human beings as human. Uh, and then it justifies their mistreatment of those people. So that's one thing. The second thing is public policy. Uh, right off the bat, you know, he hired he hired avowed white nationalists. Yeah, uh, right. He hired, uh, and and they began to uh, put into place policies to first of all stop immigration, legal immigration, and uh, undocumented immigration into this country. Uh, you know, certainly by, uh, you know, um, militarizing the southern border of the United States, putting in uh, these Muslim bans, quote unquote, that just happen to be disproportionately black and brown countries, right. uh, you know, and, and even saying, you know, certainly we welcome people from European countries, but, you know, the other <laughs> quote it. unquote shithole countries, you know, that's right. something else. The policies were uh, also uh, violent and racist. Uh, and so, you know, with that, those were two major areas. But the third thing I don't, as a nod to Elijah and the work that he and his colleagues do on Capitol Hill, he absolutely had an irreverence for our democratic norms. He ignored right. his administration, ignored subpoenas, which is, has been heretofore unheard of. Uh, he basically you know, tried to use the legal system in order to rope-a-dope, uh, to avoid accountability. <laughs> Right. Uh, you know, so, you know, in many ways, Donald Trump was not just a threat, he, he not just a danger, he was, uh, you know, certainly an enemy, I think, of the state. Right. You know, I mentioned that uh, inequality was uh, one of the issues that you've been focused on. And in, the, in, um, in my documentary, you talked about um, one of the big reasons why African Americans suffered disproportionately in the Great Recession of 2008 and 2009. And it's because of the absence of wealth in the in the black community, so that you don't have the resources to cushion the blow of an economic setback. And of course, now we're involved in this um, terrible COVID nineteen pandemic, and and the economic consequences again across the board are dire, uh, but worse for people of color. So, can you talk about how this absence of wealth in the real world? how that plays out, what the impact of that is in the real world, and, and what you've been seeing specifically um, with regard to African Americans uh, in, this, in this pandemic. So that's a huge question, and I'm going to try to answer it concisely because I want your listeners, your viewers to actually get this. Right. We often talk about income, and that's what you earn when you have a job. Uh, and when you have enough, amass enough money from your income, or if you earn enough to actually have extra money left over, you can invest that money in things like stocks and bonds and houses uh, and, you know, uh, things that uh, bring you uh, extra resources to bring you wealth. Uh, and so, you know, African Americans, because we tend to be low income, lower income, we tend to use our income to actually cover our basic needs and right. rarely are in a position to actually generate enough to actually invest in other things. Yet that being said, you know, African Americans have traditionally uh, invested in homes, which have been the major source of their wealth, even though even that has been uh, tempered by the fact that uh, their neighborhoods where they tend to live uh, are undervalued uh, relative to uh, white neighborhoods. Um, and so with that, you know, African American wealth was stripped in our lifetimes uh, by several policy driven, uh, you know, uh, events. Um, one uh, was the housing crisis. Right. Uh, you know, I think approximately more than 80% of African American wealth was tied up into home ownership, meaning that the equity that they had in their homes uh, was the real source of whatever wealth that they had. Um, and so with that, you know, when, uh, you know, the, the lenders started, you know, creating all of these exotic loan products, and then heavily marketing them into communities of color and, and uh, women uh, owned, uh, headed households. Uh, what ended up happening was is that they got into these unsustainable products that stripped them of wealth. Uh, 
The right. second thing is that when the 2008 crisis came along, we were the first to lose jobs. So even the income wasn't coming in in addition to the wealth being lost. The third thing was after the Great Recession, uh, black communities, brown communities did not recover as swiftly as white communities did. And so we were already at a disadvantage. Now, boom, COVID hits. Here Job comes COVID. Losses. Here comes COVID. Job losses dramatically higher in black and brown communities, African American communities especially. Uh, but then get this what black owned businesses we had have been, I mean, we've lost at least half. A story uh, that's not well told. They're, they they were just wiped out. They're being wiped out as we speak. And, and what's been more egregious is that the public policies that have been established, PPP was a racist policy on its front. Uh, we have, uh, you know, uh, studies that show that, you know, less than 10% of black owned, black and brown owned businesses uh, received uh, PPP money. And it was by design. And I'm actually writing a book that covers some of this right now. Uh, but even, you know, the, the remedies, quote unquote, that were supposed to actually address uh, black and brown owned businesses were not remedies because they actually used qualifiers like uh, you know, credit scoring in order right. to uh, allow people. And of course, as you well know, because of our circumstances, we have historically had lower credit scores than whites. So we are now in a dire situation. When I first started this wealth work, which was, uh, you know, back in the early 2000s, uh, you know, African-American wealth was like 12, uh, African-Americans had 12 cents uh, for every dollar of wealth that the typical white family held. Right. Um, after the Great Recession, that number went down to uh, five and six cents for every dollar of wealth that the typical white family had. Now, I haven't seen the latest numbers, but I know it's lower. And, and the irony is when you were talking about the public policies, the public policies carefully crafted to keep the resources away from the people who absolutely needed the most. It, it's, it's a bizarre situation. And, and this oh. is in today's day and age. We oh, like to right, think about right. racism, policy <laughs> racism is happening like pre-1965. Yeah. This is 2020, 2021. Right. One of the things that uh, uh, you talked about uh, was the issue of the untapped potential in this country. It's a result of uh, the inequality, um, uh, the uh, racism, uh, absence of opportunity and, and that sort of thing. But you have uh, boys and girls and uh, men and women uh, whose natural abilities, whose talents, um, uh, whose skills are um, uh, never nurtured, in some cases never even um, recognized. And, um, and, and of course the benefits uh, that would come from those folks being um, actually flourishing in our society never occur. Uh, can you talk a little bit about why that's occurring, how big a problem it, it, it is? It's a huge problem because we've actually organized our system to fail certain communities, to set, fail certain population groups. Uh, and it's uh, largely along three lines. One is discrimination. We've allowed discrimination to fester in this country and, and, and to be made official through public policies and the way that we organize our society. Uh, and so, you know, uh, I think that, you know, we've got folks uh, like Isabel Wilkerson who uh, talked about caste. And I think right. absolutely, uh, you know, a, lo a lot, I read her book and it was absolutely fabulous, but this is true. Uh, we assign value to human beings in this society uh, from light to dark uh, on racial terms. Uh, and then Christian and non-Christian and everybody else on religious terms. On gender terms, males are, have hierarchical, higher value than women. Uh, and if you were talking about other behaviors, you know, certainly, uh, you know, uh, heterosexism prevails. There's a bias yeah. to heterosexes, uh, heterosexual couples. So, you know, and then ableism is an issue. So we have all of these ways that we discriminate in our society and oftentimes they actually intersect. Uh, in ways that undercut the life's chances of human beings. The second thing is not just discrimination, but hi hypercapitalism. So we also allow our, our nation to be sorted uh, and certainly people to be, our, our goods and services to be rationed based on ability to pay. 
when you layer that on top of discrimination, what you have is a dangerous mix. And then third is lack of organization, just an inability or unwillingness to actually confront and address these issues uh, in a way that leads to a more organized society uh, that focuses on the things that matter, that is, you know, that this goal oriented uh, that serves all people. We don't have that in this country and we need all of the things to work in order to make us a great nation, a truly great nation. I truly believe that if we can get all of these things in order and in line, our best years as a nation are ahead of us. Yeah, obviously, the, pe the, the people whose talents are not nurtured, um, they suffer as a result. But the rest of us suffer, that the society as a whole um, uh, suffers. Uh, everybody who's keeping those folks down, um, the ones keeping them down also suffer. Talk, talk about um, the ways in, in, in which all of us um, feel the effects of this uh, absence of nurturing the talent that's there in our society. Yeah, so I'm, I'm writing about this now. And so as you talk about it, it, it just, it makes me emotional. First of all, I'm sitting right here in West Baltimore, which is the highest, the 2127 two, two uh, zip code, a highest poverty rate uh, in the city. Um, and, and I walk out this door uh, and see it every day. We've, we've basically had massive human waste of talent. Uh, and there is an opportunity cost to society, uh, meaning that we lose out. Freddie Gray, who was unfortunately uh, somehow, you know, killed uh, yeah. when cust and, and as a result of being in the custody of police here, he could have been a person who had the cure to cancer. Uh, you know, all these kids, you know, some of whom are out on the corners right now selling drugs as we speak, you know, they are hugely talented. They're entrepreneurs. They, they could, you know, be, uh, you know, uh, creating companies that are, you know, uh, you know on, on Wall Street. Uh, you know, we have talent that has been untapped, overlooked, marginalized, ignored. Uh, and as a result, we have, I think, created social ills uh, that undermine our safety, certainly undermine our happiness. And let me tell you, add trauma to communities that have been, uh, you know, the target uh, of this uh, ill will that's been perpetuated through systemic racism and classism. Uh, and so with that, you know, we've got people who are dealing with all kinds of issues. Some uh, basically go towards escapism, you know, drug use and over right. use uh, in order to deal uh, with their frustration. And get this, you know, historically Republicans have said, uh, you know, this is about uh, personal responsibility. I think that our systems have failed all of these people. Uh, and so, you know, we need to be talking about systemic rep responsibility, social responsibility, civic responsibility, and how we get our systems to work for all people. You know, uh, I couldn't agree more. And, and before the pandemic, I remember traveling the country and, and, and seeing young people in um, big cities and small towns all over uh, the country who didn't even understand or grasp uh, that they could grow up and become architects or they could become uh, accountants or they could become uh, scientists or, or, or artists. Uh, they're, they're not even a, a aware of the possible potential uh, that they had. I mean, it, it, it was really tragic and, and, and difficult, um, difficult to see. Um, a final question on that, on this issue, and I'm not sure how much you've been focused on this. You and I haven't talked about it, but because of the pandemic, um, we have this situation where there's uh, uh, chaos in, in terms of the education system, in terms of uh, schools, well, you know, whether kids are going to learn virtually, whether they're going to go into school, uh, whether they're learning at all. And of course, you have the inequality when it comes to access to computers, access to the internet and, and that sort of thing. You have the children of uh, parents where both parents have to work and the child is at, at home, young children. Um, are you concerned um, uh, that there are increasing deficits, in, increasing educational deficits being built up as a result of this pandemic and, and how serious of, of a problem uh, do you see this? It's a serious problem. So just like the wealth gap, uh, we have an, what they call an achievement gap. I don't like the term, uh, but there is an education gap. 
Uh, and so what we're seeing uh, in this pandemic is children are disappearing from our school systems and nobody knows where they are. Uh, and they're absolutely not getting a formal education. And that means that we're gonna be paying for this for years to come, perhaps even generations to come. Uh, because you know, whatever gains we were able to make as a result of you know, uh, you know, um, you know, the uh, Elementary and Secondary Education Act, which, you know, was the ma is the major federal investment in our public education system in this country. Whatever gains we've been able to make as a result of affirmative action uh, in this country in terms of, you know, uh, people of color, African Americans specifically, I think may be uh, seriously threatened uh, by the huge academic uh, setback that we've seen as a result of COVID. Uh, and so, you know, there are remedies, uh, you know, again, but we do not have so far the political will uh, to actually put those remedies into place. And so with that, we're going to have some major issues that we're dealing with, but we've got to have fortitude as a nation to look racism, discrimination in the face and make the clear policy decisions that need to be made in order to address these issues. I wish we had more time. We'll have to have you back. Uh, we've been talking with Dr. Maya Rockymore Cummings. Maya, thank you so much. Thank you, Bob.